it's a real privilege to be able to uh, introduce Dr. Ross Anderson, who's principal researcher at Inflection. Um, I'm going to let Ross introduce the rest of his team, but uh, I met Ross a couple of years ago at a creativity conference uh, in Oregon, uh, in Ashland, and uh, we kind of struck it off, talking, uh, struck it, struck it off? No, that's not the right word. We, we struck up a friendship. Hit it off. You hit it hit off. Hit it off. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thomas acts as uh, my brain when it doesn't work that well. Um, uh, so we hit it off very well. And, uh, and we started to talk about the possibilities of creativity and the arts. And he started to talk about his work. And then this year, when we uh, started to engage more and more with the arts and creativity and the education sector through Create, I thought it'd be wonderful to hear some in-depth work that Ross has been doing uh, in his context and to support some of the work educators are doing over here. Uh, I've had a look at the work myself. The work is exciting. Uh, the work picks up on a lot of his research and a lot of uh, his team's research in creativity, uh, the arts and education. And uh, it really is my great pleasure to introduce him and his team here today. I'm gonna put his bio uh, in the chat box so you can read from that more and more means that there's less for me to say about it, but uh, more for you to read if you want to. So uh, welcome, Ross. Thanks for being here and welcome to the team. Oh, thank you. It's a delight to be here. Um, and we did hit it off, Michael. It was, it was great. It was, it, it was awesome to have you here in Oregon. Um, that creativity conference is like uh, one of the more like international gatherings that I've been to in Oregon, actually. Um, and specifically around this work and hopefully it'll happen again. Um, and thank you also for being part of the advisory board for this project that we're gonna talk about. Um, I do have slides, but before I get to that, um, I, I do wanna acknowledge that um, Mari Livy uh, and Nate Beard and myself are on the Sayusla and the Kalapuya land here in Oregon um, and give acknowledgements to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, and we, um, we are just thrilled to talk about this work. Um, Mari Livy and Nate Beard uh, both have worked with me for the last six years. Um, we are also uh, co-founders of an organization we call Creative Engagement Lab. Um, and so Mari and, and, and Nate have their own specialty in the visual arts, in theater arts, in music, and uh, bring that into this space where we are working with teachers to generate uh, new opportunities for students. Um, and really focusing on the development of teachers as uh, these as creative designers of learning uh, in their schools. Um, we are funded through uh, federal grants locally here in, in uh, the US. Um, and it's a great program. It somehow has survived through administrations and through um, you know, the 2008 recession. And it's a, one of the only federal programs that's focused on actual grants to schools in the arts and on creativity. Um, and we've been privileged to have two of these grants and we're halfway through one of them now. Uh, and the one that we're through that we're working on now is called Make Space. Um, so I'm, I'm going to share my uh, screen so you, I can walk through these slides with you all. Um, and we're going to try to make this uh, interactive. Um, we're hoping to uh, kind of create opportunities for, for you all to ask questions. If you have, um, we'll monitor the chat box. And if there is something you'd like to stop and, and just be able to have a conversation around, please do so. It's a smaller group tonight. Um, and we'll definitely leave space at the end. Um, I'm going to go into uh, present mode here. And, um, and we'll, we'll begin this, this, uh, this presentation. So we're focusing on um, this question of how are you creative? This is the, the thrust of the question that we work with teachers on in our, um, in our experience with them. Um, this is really about cultivating and leveraging the creative resources that teachers have. We'll talk more about this framework that we've been using. Um, and here's kind of how we're gonna, we're gonna work this, this outline. Um, the, the focus will be on this work in the Make Space project and it's building off of four years that we did, uh, four years of work that we did intensively with teachers in the middle school level here, which is uh, age about 11 to 14. 
Um, and that work really informed this new project. We did a lot of research in that work. We did, uh, we generated all kinds of arts integration collaborations with teachers and it's, it allowed us to look at really what is the process of supporting teachers in this growth to come at their work not feeling comfortable in the arts, not feeling necessarily creative themselves, and becoming designers of arts integration. Um, and we learned just a, a, an enormous amount through trial and error and through kind of me, me, you know, methodical research. Um, and I'm, I'm giving you this image on the side here. This is actually a snapshot from this online course we've developed, we call the foundation course. And it's providing a, a thorough understanding of the research in creativity in the arts. Um, and the question that we've kind of flipped, it, it came out of seeing this research by a, a guy named Stan Kujai on dolphin intelligence and essentially the way that dolphin, intel dolphin research um, and a lot of other research around animal intelligence has been done, has been trying to measure intelligence like we would think of in terms of human intelligence. And he flipped the question and said, well, maybe dolphins actually have all kinds of different intelligences, and maybe it's a much different way of thinking about intelligence than we have currently thought of with people. And so the question that he posed was, it's not how intelligent are dolphins, it's how are, how are dolphins intelligent? And we've used this to frame this for teachers, um, and we'll go through the creative resources framework in this, in this presentation, and it kind of breaks open the idea of creativity into a much more democratic, much more inclusive approach. And what we've learned is that it really invites and gives permission to teachers to think of themselves actually as harboring and holding all kinds of creative resources that they can leverage for their work. And not just for their work with students, but also for their own human capital. And, um, and so it's been really exciting. We're gonna, we're gonna share some, some of their own work. And we're also gonna look at the creative routines that we bring in and offer as entry points into the classroom and as ways of developing out creative attitudes, creative thinking, creative behavior. Uh, and then we're gonna end with looking at the most recent research we've been doing um, during the COVID-19 pandemic on the role that creativity plays in teacher well-being. And what we've been learning there has been pretty exciting and we're excited to show you. Um, I just submitted a study yesterday, so it's hot off the press. Um, all right, so just getting into the foundation course here. This is a, it's an online experience. Um, here's a snapshot of what it looks like. Um, it's, it's kind of this cycle uh, across 15 hours of self-paced work of experiencing, learning about creativity, learning about the arts, and then reflecting on the role that it's playing in your life as a teacher, and then growing through actual, um, trial and error and, and actually experimenting and playing with these processes. And so we go through this experience reflect growth um, loop over and over again. And what's exciting about this is it's self-paced. We've learned um, from working with instructional designers with a lot more experience than we had. This was actually, we were completely green and wet behind the ears. And this was the first time any of us had ever designed an online course before. And so we, we had a lot of, um, expertise in this and our designer, we're going to just give him a shout out. His name is Dan, Dane Ramshaw and he just really has a lot of elegant solutions and we kept coming at him saying we want it to be more experiential. We want it to be more experiential. So we're going to show you a few things of what this looks like. Um, but the course brings teachers through as much research as we could fit into this time um, and it gives them a way to really kind of embody and, and, and grasp and, and wrestle with the ideas around creativity and learning. And uh, the hope is that, you know, our goal is that we would not only displace some of these mythologies about creativity in the arts, but we would also really take that theory and give them immediate bridges into their practice. And, and the two aspects that we just hammered through over and over and over again were reflection and metaphor. Uh, and, and we're going to talk, we're actually going to get, get a uh, view a video that we created around metaphor to help teachers wrestle with this concept. Um, and then, of course, the next phase is that we really wanted to give them a, an understanding of arts integration before we took them into the more advanced courses uh, about uh, actually taking arts disciplines and integrating them into academic domains. So we start with this framework of creative resources. So. You know, creativity, um, I've watched a few of the webinars that have been, um, that, 
that we have, that OnCon has, uh, has, has uh, presented. And it's really important that, you know, there's a, creativity needs a definition and it needs, it needs parameters. We need to really explain it. And, you know, it is a, creativity is a phenomenon of, of uh, action. It's, it's the product of creating something new and that's, that's effective or surprising and meaningful in the context. And that can be just a really, at the personal level, uh, what Ron Baghetto and James Kaufman have called little C, little C creativity. And behind that action, behind that, that actual production, there are these attitudes that are foundational to actually being creative and opening to the creative process. And there, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are really undergirding the creative thinking process. For instance, if you don't, if you're not able to hold a tolerance for ambiguity and the uncertainty, as as Ron Baghetto had talked about uh, a couple weeks ago, um, you're you're not going to stay open and curious about possibilities in divergent thinking. You might close too prematurely on one idea, or you might develop anxiety about actually having to to create something new to begin with. And this isn't a linear process, but you know, creative thinking really results in creative behavior. It results in ideas being produced. It results in action. It results in um, developing skill, craft, producing something that other people can observe or can enjoy and experience. So we, we broke these three out for teachers in order to see that it's, there's, uh, there's space for everybody in creativity and they're bringing all kinds of assets that they can use and tap into. And then, of course, there's also areas that uh, that have a lot of growth potential. And so, um, within the creative resource framework, we we're situating creativity as a process inside of student engagement in the classroom. And we wanted to we wanted to make sure that teachers saw that you know to to allow the creative resources of students to um, emerge in learning and then thrive there are certain conditions that really are important. And these are the universal needs uh, of learners to engage in learning. It's a, it's a framework that was developed out of self-determination theory um, by the research of De Desi and Ryan. And it's been, it's been something that people have spent a lot of time in to try to understand you know, how do students really engage and stay engaged in a learning process. So in the social and cultural context of a classroom, which is very complex, there is this need for belonging and relatedness. There's a need for autonomy and there's a need for competency. And we, we've sort of suggested that actually this is not complete if you think about the meaning making that has to happen for learners to engage in learning and stay engaged and stay curious. And so we've added creativity into this and thought about meaning making as really the most universal need to actually make sense of what we're learning to make meaning of it in our lives. And so this is a, a framework that we've used. And um, I don't know if, if Mario and Nate want to talk more about this. It's something that we, we, we kind of inserted into the course and then had teachers wrestle with over and over and over again. Yeah, I think, um, you know, committing to scaffolding and um, honoring each one of these needs um, throughout the, the course and our in-person trainings um, and, yeah, it's something that we've, w the, the arts provide amazing opportunities to develop a sense of belonging, competency, and autonomy. And then there's the aspect of, of the creative ideas that are produced, the creative work that's produced, um, offering new perspectives on what's being learned and what's being taught. And that has embedded in it autonomy, and it also has the sense of relatedness where, you know, you're kind of developing community within a classroom uh, to sort of see the see, look at the learning material in uh, from multiple points of view. Um, I'm going to uh, offer this opportunity for Mari to talk about creative routines. This is a foundational and sort of almost the backbone of what we're doing with teachers. Um, so go for it, Mari. Thanks, Ross. So yeah, the question is, how do we um, how have we developed ways to access these ideas like autonomy, belonging, competency for teachers as they're moving through this course and provide them with tools for taking that into their classroom? Um, I would add that it's remarkable, I think, um, 
in our conversation right before you arrived, we were able to just share a little bit about our worlds we're in, us here in Oregon and you in Australia. And I think we're in a common place right now, pretty much across the board where so many of us are working as teachers online. And we've definitely seen this um, need arise in the teachers we communicate with to attend to that belonging in a more profound way um, than ever before. It's hard to do that in a Zoom for sure. So, so inside of the course, we've really, um, the creative routines are sprinkled liberally throughout the experience. Um, teachers move through them, um, sometimes in interactives. Thank you, Dane, for all the good work that he's done with building interactives. Um, we also do videos and we offer the routines in PDF format. So they're um, pretty translatable to the classroom. And they also tend to lend themselves well to adaptation in that format. You can take and pick what you like and build your own routine. Um, right here on this slide is an example of a video. It's just a screenshot, so we won't play through this, but a video that um, has interactive aspects to it that teachers experience when they're moving through the course. This is the many uses game, which may be familiar to some of you. Um, just teachers were able to watch the video, how the game works, and then explore, in this instance, um, finding many alternative uses for attire. And we provide some ideas and then teachers kind of go into their own ideation phase. Um, the creative routines themselves are, it's a priority for us that they're simple. They don't usually require a lot of extra materials in your classroom space. And really most importantly probably is that they're repeatable. We strongly urge teachers to engage with a routine many times across a class term um, as a path to building habits that support social emotional learning, development of creative attitudes, the thinking and behaviors and conditions in the classroom for creative engagement. Um, and we also have a priority that routines um, provide opportunities for structured uncertainty. Um, yeah, growing our tolerance for ambiguity, which um, we will speak more to. Yeah, and I, I think the, um, the, the rationale behind doing creative routines with teachers um, is twofold. One was really allowing them to sort of see the breadth of modalities that you can use. So we're gonna talk about gesture a little bit. So really allowing gesture to be this form of communication that can get very intentional and can become something that teachers can recognize in students that they're actually making sense of what they're learning through their hand gestures or through their body language very cultural culturally rooted for um some groups of students that and you know often students are, are seated in the in their chairs and at their desks all day and actually their their ability to use gesture and use their bodies as a process for learning and meaning making is inhibited um, so the routines are it's kind of this opportunity to say like try these out so that you can see what takes shape the way that the community of learners actually engages and builds off of each other's ideas and begins to take scaffolded risks. And there's some, you know, there's really that setting of conditions that everybody's gonna participate, every, I, everyone's ideas are welcome. And it also really breaks from the idea that, you know, so many opportunities in classes for kids to respond to a teacher's question are about answering the right question or the right answer, providing the right answer to a question. And the, what's really wonderful about these routines is that it's, it is, there's never going to be one right answer. There's always going to be a multi, multitude. And, um, and so it's kind of, it's got this aspect of just giving teachers a new window into the talent, the perspectives, and the process that students can use in learning that are quite different than the normal, no, normal kind of way of, of conducting class. And the other aspect was to give them anchors when we say you know associative thinking is a really important creative skill we have a routine that's all about associative thinking so they you know they really kind of are able to see and and feel the texture of what this kind of thinking process is like and then see where it you know where it resides in their normal day-to-day -day life um so they're they're kind of they're playful they can be adapted as mari said they can be absolutely adapted to your teaching context 
Um, I have one, one example that I love that uh, I learned from a teacher in an interview with them was um, this selfie routine, which is, you know, just kind of drawing out a selfie, a quick selfie in like a minute of like how you're feeling in a day or, you know, um, what you ate for breakfast or, you know, it, it can be any kind of uh, topic. She was like, well, hey, we're learning the periodic table elements. What would you be today as a selfie if you were a periodic element? So it's actually really asking them to kind of think about what they know of the properties of these elements and kind of how they relate to them as a human. Um, so these kinds of routines are just like, a, they're building blocks and they're scaffolding what can be really complex in terms of arts integration, they're scaffolding it for the teacher. And um, I, I, would, I would add to that, that um, the, the routines are typically around 10 minutes long. Um, we're kind of committed to making them short and, and also easy enough for a teacher to implement after experiencing them um, one time. And so with these, we're, we're witnessing a lot of teachers um, utilizing the routines pretty rapidly after being introduced to them and, um, and then adapting from there. We will, um, we are happy to share out the, the PDFs of, of these routines. If anyone's curious, um, our contact info is at the end of this presentation. Um, okay, well, so this, we're going to kind of begin to break down this creative resources framework so we can show you um, how we have been working with teachers to cultivate some of these adaptive attitudes and beliefs and values toward, uh, towards the creative process, um, and, and then go into the thinking processes and then go into some of the behaviors and, and the action. Um, so to start with, what we were really targeting, so the research around creative self-beliefs and values and affect, it's right now the most exciting part of creativity research, in my opinion. And it's, it's kind of getting to some of the root foundational ways that as, as individuals, we approach the creative process. And it's distinct by domain to some degree. I might approach a theater task or something that's gonna require my body differently than I would a, a you know, an, mathematical task or something like that. Um, but there is also these sort of general approaches to creativity that are very powerful for individuals. And our research is, um, is revealing that this is a largely an underdeveloped area for teachers. And in fact, this course is really one of the few opportunities that we have found in the US context where teachers can get high quality training in, in preparation in creativity and, and teaching and learning. Um, there's very few teacher preparation programs that offer courses on creativity, for instance. So there are some deeply set beliefs that people are carrying about creativity. We all have our own, uh, our own beliefs, but there are kind of common, in the US context at least, very common like cultural mythologies. Um, and one of them, the, one of the biggest ones is that there are people who are born creative and there are people who are just not born creative. So it, that's a fixed growth mindset. That's a, it is a, a it is something that you have as a trait, you're endowed with biologically or physiologically um, or not. And this relates to a lot of the work that Carol Dweck has done in growth mindset and her um, incremental versus uh, entity approach to intelligence. Um, so the research in creativity has shown that this is a really meaningful belief. Creative self-efficacy is really about confidence in being able to be successful at a creative task. The value of creativity to students is really important because it's going to undergird whether or not teachers are actually going to bring in and prioritize time in the class for creativity. And then tolerance for ambiguity, we've talked about a bit. Ambiguity is that space of uncertainty. There's not one direction to go, not one answer. It's in the middle. And tolerating that is actually really hard for some people, harder for some people and, um, and there's a lot of work on this around, you know, this sort of need to make sense as humans, to need to make sense of something and get some sort of sense of certainty. Um, in the creative process, that's actually an inhibitory response often and can limit the kind of thinking that can happen. Um, and then the things that we focused on, we really want to reduce in a scaffold way. Creative anxiety, it's brand new to the field, um, was work done uh, by folks at Johns Hopkins uh, I'm sorry, in, at Georgetown, and they basically were able to find that and isolate that people have specific anxiety to creative demand. 
Um, and we found this to be absolutely the case for teachers. So we, we, we kind of worked in this process, designed this course to kind of address that little by little. And then the need for closure to face ambiguity, we wanted to reduce. Um, and then of course, like kind of all encompassing is this fear of making mistakes and the sort of almost professional or um, perfectionism. Um, so these are, the, these are kind of these undergirding attitudes. And just to reinforce that, you know, creative attitudes and thinking and, belief and, and behaviors, they, they're, it's kind of a loop. They reinforce each other. So if you can get teachers to the point of actually really engaging and then sharing their creative work, when we do, when we do in-person, uh, pre-COVID, we used to do in-person institutes. And when we've done that, you know, we're getting some teachers to actually do some drama-based work for the first time in their lives. And it's terrifying. And every little step that they take reinforces beliefs and, and reduces that anxiety. So this is an area that we focused on. Um, and uh, Mari, would you like to read this teacher quote? This is um, kind of resonating on this topic a little bit. There is a myth that creativity is like this sort of special gift that some people have. And doing the course actually was sort of like learning, oh, this is what creativity is. Oh, OK, it's accessible to everyone. Thanks. So Mari. Uh, and Mark will share this uh, this teacher work. Actually, this is one of our yeah. So this stories. this example that is shared on the screen right now is not actually a creative routine. It um, sits in another category we came to know as creative challenge, um, just because it's a little bit more involved and maybe not as repeatable as those routines that we are talking about. Um, so you wouldn't do you wouldn't um, you know habituate this into your um, classroom, but it was a valuable experience for a lot of teachers. We heard feedback from them. Um, we asked the course participants to build an avatar or a creative avatar. Um, they worked with magazines, found objects, um, drawing tools or other like painting and tools. It was very multimedia and we asked them to make a representation of their own creative resources. So after they'd explored the list and kind of unpacked um, which ones re resonated for them. They chose a collection and then they um, engaged with metaphor making around visual metaphor. And then also in the artist statements, they started to reflect and unpack that metaphor in its like greater context to their identity. Um, I'll share what this artist statement says in relation to this image that you see on the screen. The box is where most people operate. So everything I have is outside the box. I live outside in a world of fantasy, the little girl at the bottom. The dragon coming out the door represents my writing and my belief that the impossible is possible. The cogs are my intrinsic motivation or drive. The rubber band at the top is my flexibility and the tree is my growth mindset. My own creativity with technology and art are represented by the drawing of the tree and the photos pulled from technology since I didn't have a magazine. Um, mm. So naming and describing our creative strengths like this can serve to amplify and clarify um, the toolkits that we each have available to us. Um, and the act of generating a metaphor is um, for each of these creative resources. It's sort of like a way to like gaze through a, a lens that turns your um, a simple idea maybe into something a little bit more multifaceted where you can see that resource and the many, the many aspects of that resource and how you can apply them in multiple ways. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, this is an exciting example of someone engaging with metaphor, which I think in the next slide, we're gonna share like that very central role that metaphor started to play for us in, Almost. is it? No, it's not the next slide, Almost. sorry. In the very <laughs> short future. <Yeah. laughs> right. um, before moving on, one thing I wanna mention is that um, even though this was a digital experience, uh, we, we wanted to gift teachers a actual physical journal for some teachers, this might be the first journal that they've had in ages, if ever. Um, and we're asking them to interact with that journal over and over and over again. So it does become a catalog of their thinking across the course. 
and of their work. And they would photograph their work and upload it into essentially an online gallery uh, exhibiting all of their, their teacher's work. It was pretty, pretty fun to watch. And, and I think it created um, a sense, a, a kind of a, an experience of actually sharing work and going through that really vulnerable process. Uh, vulnerability is a space that we are constantly trying to create and invite teachers into. Uh, and it's possible online like this. It's very possible. And, um, and we've been kind of just overwhelmed in some ways by how much teachers are stepping into it. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe that's worth just mentioning that that image and the artist statement that we just shared on the prior slide um, comes from a growing collection. They're now in the hundreds that is like a collective gallery, essentially, that teacher participants go into. And once they've entered, once they've shared their own artwork and written their statement, then they have access to like um, looking and experiencing all the other pieces of work and the statements connected to them. And that's a pretty, it's a pretty rich experience. Like um, my, my experience as a course um, collaborator is that when I get into those spaces, it's the most exciting stuff. Like we maybe laid the groundwork, but then the outcomes there are just, you're like laughing and, you know, feeling tearful at some of the things people say. And just like, it, it's pretty, am it's amazing to make space for people to do something like this and have them do it. <laughs> yeah. And we're, so we're, we were, we're, oh, go for it. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ross, because I was going to dive into the next slide. Yeah, and we'll get to some of the research that we've been doing at the end, um, but we're pretty sure that some of that shared experience is what um, we think is kind of cultivating a, a sense of joy in, in some of what teachers are now doing. And, um, and so that's kind of one of the themes that we're sort of following is this connection between the creative process, creative development, and joy. <laughs> and we think that that's probably more now than ever uh, an antidote for the education system that's just gone through one of the most traumatic experiences um, of a lifetime. So creative thinking. Yes, with our toad staring at us. Um, I don't know what kind of toad that is, but um, so creative thinking, we, we just sort of left the arena of the creative attitudes um, after sharing that last avatar the creative avatar image with you um so much of the work that we do resides around this like opportunities for practicing different forms of creative thinking um there's probably several routines for each of um, these things on this list i'd like to read the quote to start out with actually so a teacher participant um says i've noticed an effort to allow silence as part of that uncertainty to not be afraid of those moments that are open-ended and kind of tense or awkward and just let it happen and let students discover and say what they need to say. Um, this just so much of creative thinking is about resisting our tendency toward premature closure like Ross mentioned earlier. Um, we just um, are often compelled to land on an idea simply because we want to feel landed and so much of this work, like practicing these other types of thinking, divergent, associative, metaphorical thinking, cultivating curiosity and, um, you know, men, like growing our mental flexibility, laughing, um, perspective taking, moving around and, you know, find, finding an idea and then trying it on from multiple perspectives. And lastly, our creative metacognition this actually there might be more types of creative thinking that are not on this list and if you think of other ones and you want to put them in the chat i completely um, would love to hear about them this list seems to grow for us as we engage with this work further and further but um i just want to finish this slide like our work is really about like displacing that predominant convergent thinking paradigm that at least our American school sy systems have been kind of mired in where a teacher has the right answer and the student is challenged to either know the right answer or not. Um, um, building work that just allows there to be many right answers is pretty exciting. 
So I just um, wanted the next, yeah, go ahead. Um, and uh, just keep in, keep in touch. Yeah, there we go. So somebody added imagination. Um, yeah, and we, 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 we uh, in the creative resources framework, that image, if you saw it, there's an ellipse after each of the um, lists because it's really about um, diversity and, and inclusivity and people have brought new ideas. Um, and this isn't even all that kind of creativity scholars have researched. There's even more to, than, just, than just what's here. Uh, but we're gonna kind of get, give you a, a little lens of one of the scaffolded uh, experiences that we give teachers. Yeah, so this it. is a creative, a creative routine that is um, practice in associative thinking. And our tech guy that Ross mentioned, Dane, he's a beautiful genius. And we handed him this problem and we said, make us a, a daft dictionary machine. We'd played the game live and we wanted to ha have him reimagine how we could do it in an online setting. And so the way it works is almost like a slot machine. When you get into the site um, to the point where you are, you know, welcome to Daft Dictionary, then it like randomly generates two words for you and gives you a spot to contemplate and type in a definition that you imagine those two word, that word combo might make. Um, I don't know if I explained it quite well. I think that the um, examples here will probably illuminate it. So for instance, one anonymous on July 17th was given the words elephant and meatball. And after some contemplation, they defined it as a noun, one meatball that is noticeably larger and grayer than its meatball siblings. And Additionally, Anonymous on July 16th, one day earlier, was given the word combo face and elevator. And they say it is a term used by the rich and famous, particularly the Kardashian family, which I don't know if they make their way to Australia or not, but we know them here in the United States, as a code word for plastic surgery, mainly facelifts. And here's a quote from Kim Kardashian, I'm on my way to the face elevator for an uplifting experience. <laughs> so another like so fun to go back and read through their shared examples. And we actually were hoping to um, briefly play this game with you and use the chat and just give you a chance to be daft dictionary creators it's where it's an experiment i must say because usually just one person interacts with the word combo but we're going to ask each of you to generate an idea for what this might be um ross and nate would you be willing to play the machinery of the daft dictionary yes sure Great. okay so sure. after after we turn on the machine and the words are spit out then you just have a few moments to contemplate the word combo. We do have to decide which way it aligns, or actually we don't, like you can no. realign it possibly. And then um, if you would be willing to just type your definition into the chat, um, then we'll all come away from this a little bit more informed. Okay, and on four, and I won't say four, I'll just do my counting. One, okay. two, three. Cheese. Lamp. Cheese lamp? Yes. <laughs> okay, a cheese lamp. And imagine the weird music is playing. <laughs> so while we'll, we'll, uh, we'll give a moment to imagine what a definition of cheese lamp might be for you, where you are in your house or in at work can be an object, can be an action. And um, You're when the we expert. start to see an expert, oh, so it's a cheese lamp is actually a uh, way to say goodbye. <laughs> a device used to see how moldy cheese is when it's forming in the farmhouse storeroom. Yeah, excellent, excellent. And a light for looking into mouse holes. Yes. 
Yum. Excellent. Yeah. Yes, to melt cheese over lasagna. We'll wait for one more. Lamp that shows a dappled light pattern, a la mozzarella. Oh. Use a photography to enable people to smile. Waiting for you late at night. A fromage genie, a genie, a cheese genie. All right, so this is great. So this, so this is part of the process. We want to give you a little, a little taste of how you might experience. We wanted to break up the content in the course with a lot of different. <laughs> opportunities to play. And um, this is one of the more, more playful experiences that we that we created. It's and, great. And yeah, I guess it should be noted because I didn't mention this that we intentionally left these postings with anonymous um, because of that like early um, just risk scaffolding for risk taking um, your post could be unknown, um, which felt more accessible for some users. So we are going to, uh, we're gonna watch this two minute video uh, that we created for teachers to really help them um, grasp metaphorical thinking. Um, and I, I think that this audio should come through pretty well for everybody, let's give it a shot. And thanks for your definitions, people. Beautiful. If language is the primary structure for human communication, then metaphors might be the windows in that structure. Metaphors are everywhere. Metaphors can make bridges between abstraction and the tangible. They help us empathize and connect with others by giving shape to our unseeable emotional states. We use embodied metaphor to communicate subtle and complex ideas. Metaphors can be used as powerful tools of persuasion. Developing our metaphor awareness allows us to be discerning consumers and thoughtful members of our society. Metaphors are tools for reconfiguring and broadening our understanding of complex systems and the roles we play within them. If I see school as a prison, what character am I? If I see school as a circus, what role do I play? What if I see school as a beehive or a garden? The arts is rich ground for practicing metaphorical thinking. Dancers, writers, actors, visual artists, and musicians help us see ourselves in novel ways. Chew on this. Research says we utter about six metaphors a minute, most of the time without realizing it. What metaphors will you use to find and express meaning in our complex world? So um, we wanted to show you that because it's, um, it's really foundational, um, the whole process of introducing the arts and the creative process to teachers and, and in the context of teaching and learning is so much richer when metaphor is sort of at the center and storytelling through metaphor uh, is, is become sort of a, an opening and an opportunity. So it, um, it's really kind of the, one of the most consequential things that we try to make sure they leave this course 
feeling really strong in their sense of metaphor, how it can apply the different modalities that you can, you can use for metaphor, and then even to begin thinking about, you know, how can you use metaphor to help students understand and explain really complex abstraction of science or ethics in, in literature or whatever it might be. And, um, and it's, uh, it's been a real treat to see what teachers produce. Um, and here's sort of a, another example of how metaphor can, um, can come into the same creative avatar experience. Um, does, Nate, do you want to read the artist statement? Sure. I made an avatar cut out of magazines into the shape of a person. I like to think that my mind looks at how my actions and my teaching impacts the world around us. I have a lot of privileges in this world, and I also understand how important different perspectives are to integrating in, into a diverse society. I feel as though it is more important for me to listen, listen to than to grab hold of the situation. That is why I've put earbuds for my arms. My roots that are my legs are grounded into the various ways that I try to connect with students. I want to show them the breadth of choices and the various ways that they can tap into their own curiosity. Great. So um, the kind of third piece of the creative attitudes, creative thinking, now we're at creative behaviors. Um, and this is really where we're, we're talking about the, the doing and the making. Um, so creative action is persistent and committed, embodied and gestural, visual and 2D and 3D, collaborative, observant, crafty and skillful, and iterative. We have a quote here from a teacher participant that says, well, I wasn't that great of a drawer in class, but I tried. And I tried with my group and my group supported me. Maybe I could try with my kids, even though I know I suck and just give it a whirl and maybe they'll help me make it better. Um, something that we really emphasize in, in our work um, is process over product and um, embracing um, and normalizing creative anxiety. Um, so we encourage, um, you know, bad drawings and, and first drafts that are unrefined and um, some of the messiness of the creative process. We just had a teacher actually um, do a little TED Talk style video about the importance of em embracing embarrassing creativity. And um, so, um, and, and we help, you know, make space for teachers to um, practice these behaviors in different modalities. Um, so what you're seeing here is gonna be a series of gestures um, where teachers in the course actually film themselves doing um, theater gestures to represent different concepts from the course. And so here we have um, a gesture for autonomy. And in the next slide, we have a gesture for belonging. And obviously these are just stills, um, screenshots, but these were actual videos um, at the beginning and middle and an end to the gesture. And here is a gesture around sewing that demonstrates competency. Um, That's one of the entry level theater activities that we use um, where students can actually um, use gesture for, you know, vocabulary acquisition, um, but they can also use gesture to express um, more, you know, metaphorical or abstract ideas. And this, this gesture, I'm actually not um, sure what this gesture is representing, but if you have an idea of what this gesture might be representing, go ahead and put it into the chat. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off with freedom there. <laughs> Here's a, a, another example of, you know, through routines and through these um, creative challenges throughout the courses, we're in, engaging in these different behaviors and one of them is um, mind mapping and to help make uh, their thinking and feeling visible. And so we encourage a lot of mind mapping and, and drawing and sketching and, and definitely reflection. And what's in the next slide here? Um, 
a, a huge part of the behaviors, um, in, especially as they relate to the arts, is developing skills in observation and listening. And so we've built these little isolation windows um, out of cardstock and teachers went around um, like treasure hunting using this isolation window looking for different things. It could have been a, um, you know, principles of design from visual arts. It could be ideas, um, something beautiful or artful or something as juicy as emptiness, for example. Um, so that was another practice they use. Um, next slide. We went into some photography challenges. Um, you know, the whole idea being that we're making space for many multiple drafts and um, then sharing work in progress and, um, and helping teachers reflect that they have creative behaviors that are outside of the arts as well. Um, so we will have them, you know, get metacognitive about their creative resources in other parts of their life, like cooking or parenting, teaching, um, anything like that. So, um, great. What else? Um, oh yeah, and then on the next slide. we have built out after the teachers go through this um, foundation course they can enter a strategy course of their choice kind of what they're most drawn to and there's one in visual arts for making thinking and feeling visible there's a music and media arts integration um, where we explore sound and, and story making um, some music rhythm and then a theater integration course for embodied learning um, so that's a way for teachers to get exposure and experience with different modalities of um, these creative behaviors and to um, not only practice them and experience themselves, but also be, feel equipped to bring these um, experiences to their students. That's great. And we've, we're going to wrap up by just talking a little bit about the research that we've done um, to date. Um, and we've, we've got some, like an er early study uh, with about 32 teachers that went through um, the full foundation course and then an uh, in-person summer institute that was about 14 hours. Uh, and what we sound, found um, across um, that experience is that compared to where they began at the beginning of the course, uh, their fixed mindset beliefs about creativity massively reduced. Um, one of these effect sizes that you almost never see um, is like 1.8 standard deviation effects, or 1.8 standard deviations. Um, and then creative anxiety reduced at a large effect as well. Um, and what we saw enhanced were some of these really important uh, aspects of their kind of creative agency and their creative identity. So perceiving value of, create, of creativity for students being high, uh, creative self-efficacy in teaching, and then also that they, they shifted their perceptions more positively about actually what arts integration can do for students. Um, and happy to say that actually uh, got a really good review back just today. So this study is going to be impressed pretty soon um, from in teaching and teaching teacher education. Um, and then most recently, we've been now, uh, I mean, we kind of just like we got very lucky by putting a lot of emphasis on designing really good quality online experiences for teachers right as the pandemic has hit. And so we got a pretty good response from Oregon teachers. We're focused on, on rural teachers who really in the US have much less access to high quality professional development. Um, and so we've got uh, 57 teachers that went through um, our, our online experience. We did a virtual summer institute and we'd never quite pulled something like that off before, but uh, a lot of the same ideas kind of doing asynchronous work with like videotaped uh, presentations using different modalities to reflect on and engage with that material and then coming back into synchronous time in zoom and and engaging in chat and kind of uh, having a, a more of a, a synchronous experience with with each other um, so that worked well and what we learned in this study this is a, this is going to come out in this uh, really really important special issue in frontiers in psychology which is uh, open source so it'll be free to the public um, and it's a bunch of articles that are focused on creativity in times of crisis and we we uh, are submitting this, we just submitted this paper yesterday, and it's really looking at the links here that you see. Uh, we found that this is 
before they started the course, this is where teachers landed after experiencing the three months of, of school closure. Um, their creative self-efficacy in teaching uh, seemed to be a support at a medium effect size of their buoyancy in teaching, ability to, to respond to setbacks. Um, their creative growth mindset uh, landed more positive, just general affective experiences in teaching. So more enthusiasm, more interest, um, and then specifically also uh, environmental support for creativity was probably the most, the most broadly um, impactful aspect of their creativity. Uh, so any, you know, anybody out there in schools now, I mean, knowing whether or not, you know, your school environment and this, you know, your colleagues and your administrator, whether or not they support creativity in their students and learning, it's a, it plays a big role. Um, and so I don't know if that resonates with anybody, but that's what we found with our, with our, with our teachers. Um, it, uh, it translates to more dispositional joy in teaching, less negative affective experiences. And then um, this link, I think, is one of the most interesting. And so once, it, it really leads us to want to focus in on creative anxiety even more because there was a large effect uh, with lower creative anxiety also having lower secondary traumatic stress. And it's, a, it's an idea that's just now coming into education, the fact that as teachers, or administrators, there's secondary traumatic stress taken on by caring for students who are going through trauma. And this is something that's lived in the social work uh, field, but never kind of in education until the last couple of years. Um, and so we're paying more attention to that because of the, the schools that we're working in are highest poverty and, and kind of highest student transients and highest lowest resource. So the, the trauma that's experienced by students is real teachers are, are, are experiencing that. And what we're seeing here in this relationship that we really want to probe deeper in is if you can handle looking at the challenge of creating something new and working in a creative process, it, it may be more adaptive. It may be adaptive to actually reducing the, the experience of intrusion and, and, and emotional arousal uh, of secondary traumatic stress. So that's just kind of geeking out in this a little bit. We're seeing distinct relationships with creative beliefs, with creative support in your environment and with this creative affect of creative anxiety. Um, and it's telling us a, a story of overall well-being for teachers during this kind of time of crisis. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we have for you today. This is, this is where we're kind of focusing our energy is, um, you know, is, is kind of learning more about what is happening around the world, around creativity and education and learning from that. And we have one, one, um, initiative in the hopper right now. It's under, it's a grant under review uh, to collaborate with um, other organizations in five different states in the U.S. to create what we've called a creative teaching hive. And so it would be an online space that's almost entirely self-guided for teachers to really dive deep into areas of creativity, social justice, cultural responsiveness, um, social emotional learning, and Find, find and kind of build out a system um, to support teachers all over the US and then hopefully we could find collaborators in the future um, around the globe. And we'll know more about that in a couple months, but that's kind of, we're looking now to collaborate bro more broadly and, um, and uh, you know, starting here with, with you all is, 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 is one step in that direction. And so we really appreciate being here. Um, I will go to the final slide here, which has, um, a link to our blog where you can sign up and we'll, we'll post the creative resources PDF framework in a blog post. We'll, we'll get that blog post out uh, next week. And um, so if you want to um, download those resources or the routines rather, um, check out the blog. That's my email address. You can email me if you want to directly. Um, and I'd love to uh, just kind of field some questions now. Thanks, Ross. Uh, the way we, we can do questions pretty much uh, just as they come to you, really, uh, anyone who's uh, in the session. So if you've got questions, just punt them up, unmute and punt them up. Or Thomas, is that possible? Can we do that? People should be able to unmute okay. themselves. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. I might ask the first one to get us rolling. Um, so from the research you've done, Ross, uh, the one that's in, you know, almost in press, under review, in press-ish, and that one that you talked about in front, Frontiers, what is it that you think you are able now to claim around engagement with creativity? Like what, what are the, I, I suppose what I'm saying is, 
how can we move the research that you've now got in the American context, admittedly, but how could we start to think about that in the ways that we could impact policy in education around that? Well, so the premise of that second paper is, is kind of a scary premise because it, it's looking at the teacher shortages that we have in almost every state, especially in rural areas, higher disengagement in teaching than ever before, ever before that we've recorded. 60% uh, of US teachers are currently reporting that they're looking for other jobs. <laughs> and, now, and that was back in 2019, so that was before COVID. Um, and, you know, and then you just look at the stress level and the experience. I mean, teachers love their job, but they also are, in, in the US context, a lot, in a lot of cases, they are, they're struggling. And, it, and it's not a profession that we see lower rates of, of enrollment in teacher preparation programs ever before. So I guess talking about the policy level, you know, if we can, if we can show a link between, you know, definitely creativity as a, as a human capital resource that we need to be investing in for teachers, um, and we can see links to improved pedagogy, higher levels of engagement for students, which we're not there yet. I mean, our, our, our research is right now just at the teacher level, but the next step is, well, what about engagement in the classroom? And if we can connect it there, and we can also connect it to just overall teacher well-being, um, I think it has policy implications in terms of actual retention and attraction into the profession. Um, so for me, that's sort of the, the link that I would make at this point. Um, but this is, you know, this is still pretty preliminary. Um, and there are ways that the urban and rural context can be similar. But I think when we're talking about the rural context, we're talking about teachers who are already asked to teach in many different, you know, cross grade levels and different content areas. Um, couple of the schools we're working with haven't had a one te one school hasn't had an art teacher in I think four or five years a visual arts teacher so it's you know there's a, a level of adaptation that's required I think of teachers in these contexts yeah thanks Ross yeah. any questions um, I see one about environmental support for creativity in the chat um, the way that this was measured with five items in the survey was looking at whether or not the school prioritizes student creativity, whether or not the school values it, specifically whether or not the administrator values student creativity. So it's really focused on creativity and learning and student creativity. And it's, you know, it's pretty general, it's, but it's, um, it's a variable that we've used and we found to be um, pretty important in, in different ways. And for me, this was a, this was a surprise. I didn't expect it to, to be so related to these you know, positive and negative affect for teachers in school. Um, but I think that that makes me more curious for sure. So James um, got a question. Well, it's kind of a comment. Jane, do you want to do you want to express that? Yeah, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for your presentation. Uh, yeah, it's really inspiring. Um, I've just started out um, lecturing in visual arts education in early childhood and um, primary teachers. And I just think this course would be so important in a university setting, you know, to get them before they're in the um, workplace. I mean, I still teach in a school as well. And I, I know that the um, staff that I work with would really benefit from this kind of program as well. So, yeah, just wondering how we can copy and paste it in an Australian context. Um, I mean, I mean, that's a, it's, it's a great, it's a great thought. And um, we, well, I, thank you. I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> yeah. we, we are, we, <laughs> we have a programmer who's just, an, he's really an artist and, uh, and just a problem solver. And so we've, we've definitely thought about how we can take this and make different kind of portals for different uh, organizations. And we would love to, we would love to give this to you if you want to look we can give we can make you a test user so you can just go through it and check it out um and you know we should talk offline if, if this is something that you really yeah. think there might be um real interest in we can we're we're very interested in in uh looking at how we can make this as useful as possible we have put an inordinate amount of time into yeah. designing and building it um so we're very interested we have a a group of what may turn out to be about 200 art teachers in the philadelphia school district who are going to start um, so that'll be a biggest cohort we've had. Um, but I think that there's absolutely a 
potential and at a low cost, I mean, for us to be able to internally do it, to just kind of build out something that you would be able to show you, you could have um, access to with your students. It's yeah. a learning management system. Yeah, it's a learning management system that's just happens to be incredibly customizable. And we're working with the designer, the original designer of the LMS. Um, mm. So, and I want to add it, that it's definitely on our bucket list to bring it to other countries. You know, I feel like the process of building something and then having um, this collection of teachers comb through it and response and be a part of the like development process was really powerful. And we would love to do that in other contexts because the work can only improve if it's, you know, viewed through more lenses. And the Australian lens would probably reveal some exciting, you know, biases perhaps, or just like inform us and broaden our process for sure. Yeah. Fabulous. Well, we're on time. So uh, I just want to take this opportunity uh, to thank, uh, thank the team, uh, Ross particularly, uh, for putting all this together, Mari and Nate. I mean, the, this work is actually kind of world leading in lots of ways. And I think the more that we can uh, get the word out about it, uh, the better. I, I think there's some always going to be some translation issues when we move from one culture to another. But I think there's some really strong infrastructure, some really strong research and some fantastic work that's coming out of it. And uh, and I've had a look through the program. I've supported the program in different various ways in advisory roles. And I, I'm very minor advisory roles, but uh, I'm really excited about the possibility for this work and the research that's coming out of it. So thanks very much, much Ross, Murray and Nate, and uh, all the best uh, with the, this, the further journey of this work. And I hope that anyone who's been with us or sees this on the video can contact you. And I know from personal experience, Ross uh, is a very generous collaborator um, and his team are very generous. So I think um, the, the opportunity to engage is a really uh, authentic one and a really generous one. So please take advantage of that if you're at all interested. Thanks very much, everyone, uh, for joining this session. Uh, look forward to seeing you in November. Keep up with the e-news to see what's going. Thanks for Thomas DeAngelis for making it all possible and bringing it all together. And uh, look forward to seeing you all soon at a CREATE event. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.